Okay. So um, to begin, I guess I, I think it would be helpful to think about uh, sort of commonplace explanations that, that people give for why gender inequality in Japan uh, takes the form that it does. And I think that one of the explanations that you hear a lot is that there's not enough women at the top of Japanese organizations. Um, and hence you get uh, organizations like the World Economic Forum saying Japan's gender inequality needs to be solved from the top. Um, so I think that this is a very common perception of what the root causes of Japan's uh, gender inequality are. Um, but this isn't just the World Economic Forum saying this, right? Um, the Japanese government uh, in, in many ways takes a similar approach. And so the way that this manifests itself, this, this idea that we're gonna solve gender inequality from the top down is things like this. So this is just cut and pasted from the fifth uh, basic plan for gender equality. And it's showing by 2025, we wanna have this percentage of women in kakaricho positions, this percentage in kacho positions, and this percent in bucho positions. So really aiming at the top of organizational hierarchies. Um, and then some other ways that manifest itself, looking even higher up in organizations, there's targets for um, getting women onto the boards of listed companies, or companies specifically listed in the first section of the Tokyo Stock Exchange. So very, very elite companies. Um, and then you, you also see policies like this recently announced by the finance ministry um, that they're going to require listed companies to uh, publish the share of women in managerial positions at the firm. Um, so these are the type of initiatives that you see that, that really highlight and illustrate this belief that this is a problem that we're going to solve from the top of organizations. Um, but at least from one way of looking at it, that's a really weird way to go about solving the problem of gender inequality in Japan or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and the, the way in which that this is very weird uh, is if you look at the occupational structure, um, so the entire workforce in Japan, and you see how people are divided up into occupations, you can see here that uh, managerial occupations are a tiny, tiny share of the total occupational picture in Japan. Um, so just fewer than 2% of all workers in, are in managerial positions. Um, so from that perspective, it's kind of peculiar and puzzling that we would be focusing so much attention on solving gender inequality in that segment of the economy. Um, but there is a reason uh, why people focus so much there. And, and this is a, a reason which I think is, is shared between Japan and the United States and many other countries, which is this idea that um, women are really going to change the culture. Um, and there's sort of many different ideas about what that means to change the culture. Uh, but one idea is that having more women in management positions will change how women are perceived. And so people will view women as more capable of leadership, um, is having more potential, being more promising if we just have more women in those leadership positions. Uh, so this is one example of, of people expressing this belief and it's from a, a woman who is a diversity consultant in the United States. And she says, what's the most effective change that can be made to make workplaces better for women? Get more women into senior leadership. When women are a critical mass in the decision-making apparatus of an organization, the culture changes. So once again, you know, we have this general concept of culture, but specifically one of the things that that means is how women are perceived. Um, and that this is a very widespread belief um, in the discipline of sociology as well. Um, so you see sociologists Huffman, Cohen, and Perlman saying, the entrance of women into managerial roles improves the status of other women at the establishment. Uh, so look, you know, looking within an establishment or within a firm, if you have more women in management, um, then perception of and treatment of non-managerial women is better, is what they're saying there. And then you also see people making a, a, a very similar argument in the specific um, case of Japan. So um, 
Kumi Ko Nemoto's book from 2016, she says, the absence of women in authority in firms influences female subordinates' view of women in positions of authority as untrustworthy, rather than seeing them as role models or mentors. So once again, there's this idea that uh, having more women in management will sort of positively uh, change how people perceive women. So this is the reason why uh, people tend to focus so much on the top of organizational hierarchies in thinking about addressing gender inequality. Um, and in, indeed, this belief has pretty um, strongly supported theoretical backing in status construction theory within sociology. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with that, status construction theory posits that when you have group level differences in power and resources, so you know, on average, men have more power and resources than women, um, that changes how individual members of those groups are perceived, whether, you know, regardless of their individual characteristics, right? Um, so members of powerful and well-resourced groups are perceived as more meritorious and, and more deserving. And then because people have, have these beliefs about individuals um, based on group level differences, then they um, treat them differently, right? Uh, so members of high status groups receive more deference and respect, uh, but they're also seen as more deserving of material rewards. Um, so of course, this whole process is kind of self-reinforcing uh, that because people have these beliefs, then they distribute rewards, uh, unequally, and then that contributes to the structural gaps, um, which set the whole process in motion. Um, so th this is really the theory on which a lot of these people who are saying um, women's entrance into management will change ideas about women. They're all drawing on this. Um, but interestingly, when you really dig into uh, the research that has been done on this topic, it actually offers very weak uh, empirical support for this strong claim um, that women in management really change how women are perceived in the workplace. So I'm just going to give you some examples of um, the types of, of evidence that are used in, in this field, and we can see that it rests on very shaky ground. Um, so for example, um, there are studies that look at very male-dominated organizations. And that includes the classic study by Rosabeth Moss Cantor, um, it, who, uh, um, you know, she, her famous book is Men and Women of the Corporation. And this was a very male-dominated organization. Almost all of the managers were men. And she noticed that in this organization, uh, they were very devaluative ideas about women in general. And so she posited that if there were more women in management, we wouldn't have those devaluative ideas, but she was looking at one organization which was itself quite male dominated. Um, so this is really more of a hypothesis rather than a conclusion that she could come to from, from the data that she analyzed. And the same goes for Nemoto's study of Japanese firms, um, that she also finds that there's very devaluative ideas about women. Um, women just aren't viewed as capable, um, as, as um, strong and intelligent as, as men. Um, and she says, well, we need to get more women into positions of power in order to change that. But since all her, the organizations she studies are quite male dominated, once again, that's a hypothesis rather than something that she can prove with her data. Um, and then there's a whole host of studies which look at uh, the share of women in management in a company and either they compare across companies and compare organizations that have more women in management and less women in management, uh, or they follow the same organizations over time and, and see what happens with various metrics of gender inequality uh, as more women move into management or perhaps as women leave management. Um, and this, these studies are, are um, they're probably more, more frequently cited as, as actually providing evidence for this claim. But first of all, they're generally linking two structural outcomes. So it will be you know, women's percentage of management uh, and does that affect the gender wage gap of non-managerial women or something like this. Um, so they're not actually measuring attitudes, uh, even though people use these studies to say that there's support for this hypothesis. Um, so they're measuring structural outcomes, but what's 
perhaps even more concerning about these studies as a basis for this claim that women in management um, matter for how women are perceived or you know, matter significantly for how women are perceived is that the effect sizes are very, very small. Um, so they have these massive data sets, they get statistical significance, but if you look at what they actually find, so for example, the, the Kurtulis and Thomas kovic DV study, they find that a 1% increase in women's representation in management is associated with a 0.1% increase in women's representation at the next level of management down. So this is just tiny, right? You, even if you have a, a switch from women being 0% of management to 100% of management, all you would get is a 10% increase at the lower level. Um, so that's hardly enough evidence to bolster this very strong claim that this is the thing that we need to do to change attitudes towards women. Um, and then I've actually only been able to find one study uh, that actually addresses this core question of the relationship between gender composition of management and gender attitudes. So there's one study which is supportive, uh, but that is a very narrow base on which to form all these government policies and to make all these really strong claims. Um, so, so based on this, I think two things. I think, first of all, um, in order to back these strong claims, we need much more evidence and empirical investigation of the relationship between uh, women's representation and management and attitudes about women. But also, um, given these small effect sizes in the structural studies, I think we need to think beyond this and think about other determinants of attitudes towards women in the workplace. Um, so that's what I'm doing in, in the paper that I'm discussing today. Um, and in, in terms of what some of those other determinants might be, uh, I think we can actually go back to status construction theory and get some useful hints there. Uh, so status construction theory points out that status beliefs, so these um, beliefs about the sort of value, worth, meritoriousness of women and men, they form in interactions between less resourced workers and better resourced workers. Um, so it's really about both types of actors, the less resourced and the more resourced. Uh, but in their focus on women managers, empirical studies are really only focusing on one of those levels. And they're completely ignoring the other side of this status coin. And obviously, you can't have high status unless you have low status as well. So I think that that's a significant oversight. And if you have any doubt um, that the composition of low status jobs might matter for how women are perceived, um, I would direct you to consider how often women in professional and managerial jobs are mistaken for assistants or secretaries. Um, so I found many examples from many different fields. This is something that happens to professors. It's something that happens to engineers. It's something that happens to photographers, which is particularly interesting because photography is, a, is female dominated, actually. Um, it happens to politicians. It happens to doctors. Um, it happens to lawyers. So really any profession that you can imagine, there's many, many women who have had this experience of being mistaken for a much more low status person in that profession. And if you just, Google mistaken for a secretary, you get 3 million Google hits. So we know this is an incredibly common experience, um, which strongly suggests that the fact that most secretaries and assistants are women is affecting how women are perceived even when they're in professional or managerial positions. Uh, oh yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't resist putting this in um, because I just saw this in the New York Times the other day and it's the perfect example of what I was talking about. Uh, but this is, a, this is an article about a former National Security Council senior director, Fiona Hill, um, who President Trump mistook her for a secretary and became angry that she did not immediately agree to retype a news release for her. Um, so, you know, Trump, I think, is an exceptional case in many ways, but uh, in this instance, this is an example of something that's much more structural and not just about him as an individual. 
Um, so I, I really think that uh, this question about um, how, how women's uh, concentration in jobs at the bottom of occupational hierarchies, how that affects the perception of women is a very important one. And there's lots of um, anecdotal evidence to support that, but it's never really been empirically investigated. Uh, so that's what I'm doing in, in the study that I'm presenting to you today, which is, of course, from Japan. So I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, the data that I collected and, and the analyses that I did to investigate this question. Um, so, so what I did was I, I collected data from one uh, large global manufacturing firm um, and their employees in Japan, which I call Sasaki Solutions. And I did this uh, last year. Um, and what this organization did is it, um, it gave me and my collaborators, so uh, Hiroshi Ono is here, he's one of the people that I, I've been working with on this broader project, um, but they gave us access to all of their employees, so 9,000 employees, and we were able to send a survey to every single one of those. Um, over a third of them responded, and they, so we have about 3,500 um, employees nested within 50 departments in eight divisions of this large firm. And our survey collects extensive background information from the respondents. And we also did a survey experiment, which I used here to capture gender attitudes. So the research question is, are attitudes towards women's workplace advancement less favorable in units where women's share of subordinate jobs is higher? Um, and in order to understand how I analyze this, I want to show you what the stru structure of employment is at Sasaki Solutions. Um, Sasaki uses three job tracks for their Seishain or, or regular employees. So there's a production track, and um, these are people who are working on the factory floor. And there's a management track for white collar workers eligible to become managers. And then there's a clerical track, which is for support roles in, in white collar capacity. Um, and both production track and management track workers have a path to management, but clerical track workers do not. Um, clerical track workers can technically convert to the management track, but in reality, uh, that's impossible for almost everyone because in order to do that, you have to show a record of accomplishment, um, which is basically impossible to achieve, um, given that you're mostly doing things like filing papers and producing documents. You just can't build up that record of achievement um, while you're doing the tasks that are assigned to you as a clerical track worker. Okay, uh, so this is the composition of the sample by gender and track. And you can see that most of the workers are management track men, uh, but the management track is not completely male, right? So 13% of the employees on the management track are female. So this is a very male dominated firm as, as is typical in the manufacturing industry. And then the clerical track is predominantly female, but it's not exclusively female. So 13% of the clerical track workers are men, um, which offers the potential for some interesting variation across different uh, divisions or units, departments of the firm in terms of um, whether the clerical track is very heavily female within a given unit or not. Um, I also want to give you a sense of the composition of management, management versus um, non-managerial employees. So you can see at level one, which is the lowest level of the organizational hierarchy, um, women are actually more than half of the employees at this level, but these upper levels, which are not open to clerical track employees, you see the percentage of women just drop off precipitously. Um, so it's particularly the upper levels of management, which are so male dominated in this firm. All right. Um, so specifically, what I do for the analyses is I look within the each unit of the firm, um, the composition of the clerical track workers in those firms and what percentage of them are women. And that's what you're seeing here highlighted in red. So we can see that um, the average unit has 
70% 70, 70 of the clerical track employees in the, the average unit um, are women. But there's also considerable variation across units. So there are units where either there are no clerical track employees um, or all the clerical track employees are men. And so those take a value of zero here. And then there's also units where all the clerical track employees are women. Um, Obviously, because the, the average is 70%, there are more units on the higher end, but there are some on both sides. So this gives us the variation that we need to look at if attitudes towards women um, vary depending on, on this um, aspect of the unit. I should also add here uh, that the variation in women's managerial authority by unit is not very high. So that the average percentage of employees within a unit who are supervised by women is 3.1%. Um, the median is 1.7, and this only ranges from zero to 20%. So there are no units um, where there's a lot of powerful female managers. Okay, uh, so that's the independent variable. And then the dependent variable is attitudes towards women. And I'm particularly interested in attitudes towards women's advancement. Um, and the way that I measure that is through a survey experiment. So we have a survey experiment. Um, I'm not gonna read it all out to you, uh, but it describes a candidate for promotion. And this is a very excellent candidate for promotion. Um, and at the end of this, this vignette, uh, the respondent is asked to, to make a recommendation about how HR should handle this person's promotion. And they could say, uh, promote this person immediately, uh, or they could select various delays, um, like promote them later, or remove them entirely from, from consideration. But the name of the candidate randomly varied. So it could be a male name, or it could be a female name. So some, some respondents saw this with a female name and some saw it with a male name. Uh, and then we can look at relative to people's recommendations for men, are people less likely to recommend female candidates for promotion in the units where more of the uh, clerical track respondents are women? So I should also add that there were a couple other manipulations um, in this vignette. So you see the highlighted sentence that says, when the time comes, the HR department discusses this person's promotion. Um, but in some versions of the vignette, uh, there was an additional sentence added here indicating that this promotional candidate had taken a leave. And that could be a sick leave or it could be a parental leave. And it, it was a varying length. Um, but I'm not interested in these other um, survey experimental manipulations for this particular study. I'm only looking at the gender manipulation, but those, those were there as well. Um, so in the results, I'm combining the, the results for all versions of the vignette, including those who, uh, who took leaves, although I'm not analyzing them separately. Okay, so these are the results of, of modeling this. Um, so the outcome variable of, of this regression is a recommendation for immediate promotion. So it's a binary variable. And um, I'm interacting in this model, whether the candidate in the vignette was female with the proportion of clerical track employees who are female. And we see a significant and negative relationship here. So that means that people are less likely uh, to recommend the female candidates in the units where a higher share of the clerical track employees are female. And if we plot that, it looks like this. Um, so here, the, the zero line is the recommendation for men. So we're looking at the comparison between women and men. And what we can see is that in the units where um, clerical track is balanced or male dominated, there's no statistically significant difference um, in recommendations for female versus male candidates. But in these units where uh, clerical track jobs are heavily dominated by women, there is a significant difference. Um, so women are about five to 6% less likely to be recommended for promotion um, in the units where the clerical track is, is most female dominated. Um, and we can, we can also add to this um, plot of the trend of the relationship, the actual points representing the units. 
So here, each point represents the unit, um, and the uh, the color represents the division. And I just put that on here so that you can see that there's not any sort of clustering by division. It's all scattered kind of randomly throughout. Um, and we can also see that you know there's many more units on this side where in, um, the clerical track is, is female dominated as we would expect from the descriptive statistics that I showed you earlier. Um, and the size of the point represents the number of employees in the unit. So we can also see that this isn't being um, driven by particularly large units or particularly small units or anything like that. Um, but the, the main thing that I, I want to think about um, with this graph in our minds is uh, what exactly it is about um, women's overrepresentation in subordinate jobs, which makes people view women promotional candidates differently. And in order to do that, I think what's really valuable are the qualitative comments left by respondents. So we asked the respondents to reflect if they thought um, men were advantaged in promotion or women were advantaged in promotion. And then if they said, you know, I think one or the other is, we asked them to be very specific about in what ways are, are men or women advantaged in promotion. And if you look at these qualitative comments, and we have, we have thousands of these qualitative comments, right? Uh, a very interesting pattern emerges, which is in uh, these units where there's a lot of women in clerical track positions or where most clerical track jobs are held by women, uh, people bring up uh, the fact of how work and training are allocated. Uh, so they say things like this, men are preferentially selected for high value jobs, participation in projects, business trips, and training. Then because they have that background, they are preferred as promotional candidates. And I have a couple examples of comments like this. So even if you have the same job title, the man will be given the project lead just because he's a man. For women, it's more like, even though you're a woman, we'll let you do X, Y, Z. Um, men are usually treated preferentially in work assignments. They do almost no busy work. So what you can see in, in these units is that people are really not seeing women as worthy of or capable of more high value jobs. And this is affecting how women on the management track are being treated as well. And the interesting thing is that there were no comments like this in the, the other units um, where the clerical track is not female dominant. People did not talk about the allocation of work in this way. I and mean, people had other explanations for um, why men might be um, advantaged in promotion. Like across the board, people said, you know, women take parental leave or women can't work as long hours. So that was common across all units, but there was this really uh, distinct divide in, in the qualitative comments in regard to how employees are trained and how work is allocated, which I think really gets to the heart of, of the mechanism here, of why women's concentration in subordinate jobs may drive gender attitudes in this way. All right. Um, and then I, I kind of want to circle back to this question of women's representation in management and how that might affect gender attitudes. And I will say that this particular study site is not a great study site for investigating this question, because as I said, like many of the other studies that people have done, it's heavily male dominated. So there's not a lot of variation um, in women's representation in the managerial ranks across units. Uh, but that said, we can look at the variation that does exist. And there's no evidence here um, that people view female promotional candidates more favorably in the units where there are more female managers. Um, I don't, because this is a very male dominated organization, I don't think this like disproves this or anything like that. You know, the possibility is certainly still there, uh, but it certainly doesn't provide any evidence in support of that. Um, well, I do think it, it strongly shows uh, the importance of the composition of subordinate um, assistant type positions. 
All right. Uh, now, I finally want to link this back to immigration, which I think may be what Gracia asked me to talk about. Um, but uh, so I, I do think that this is connected. Um, so if we think about Japan's foreign worker population, um, the total foreign population is larger. But if we think of the, the foreign uh, people, foreign citizens living in Japan who are working, it's 1.7 million in 2021, which is 2.5% of the total working population of 66.7 million. So it's a very small percentage. And if you uh, think about what uh, visa categories allow people to work in Japan, um, they're various, but probably the one that's the closest to sort of um, routine office work is the specialist in humanities and international services visa. Uh, but this, because it has the word specialist in it, can't technically be used by companies to hire someone who's going to be doing predominantly clerical work. So companies may get around this in various ways, uh, but there are constraints on uh, large firms' ability to place, say, immigrant women uh, or immigrant men in these positions at the bottom of the white collar occupational hierarchy. Um, and so, you know, on one hand, they're constrained by the small number of foreign workers uh, in Japan overall, but they're also specifically constra constrained by the visa categories that exist. And so what this means is that foreign workers of either gender can never become the face of low status positions in white collar firms. Um, and as a result, ethnicity and national origin do not become entangled with status beliefs uh, to the same extent as, as gender does. So we see um, with gender this very self-reinforcing cycle uh, in, this, in this large firm. Um, and at least within the context of large white collar workplaces, that same self-reinforcing cycle doesn't have the opportunity to get started uh, with it where it comes to foreign workers. So there may be you know, prejudices and biases against foreign workers, in particular against Asian workers um, in Japanese society more generally, but they're not reinforced in everyday life in these white collar contexts to the same extent uh, that, um, that gender is. And I think that that possibly speaks to the part of the reason for why a gender inequality is so high in Japan that other countries that either have um, larger shares of uh, visible native minorities or of immigrants, um, there's it's a process of substitution for uh, so ethnic majority female labor is more possible. And uh, this gives um, white women in Western contexts some opportunity to free themselves from the stereotypes associated with the bottom levels of the occupational hierarchy, which uh, native born Japanese women do not have in part because of this low migration regime. All right, uh, so just some concluding points. Uh, Government efforts, which I discussed in the beginning, and also media reporting on Japan, illustrate the strong faith that more women in management will somehow change the culture um, in the workplace. But as I showed you, the empirical foundation for this belief, either in the United States or Japan or any other context, is quite weak. Um, theoretical grounding and anecdotal evidence indicate that the composition of subordinate jobs might be important for the creation of gender beliefs, but there's been no empirical studies of this topic. And so this study shows that attitudes towards female career advancement are less positive, where women make up a larger share of clerical jobs. And I argue that this is because the long shadow of the secretary falls on all women, both clerical track and managerial track. So where women are the face of subordinate jobs, all women are assumed to be less capable of and interested in high value jobs. And this is not a Japan specific phenomenon, right? We know that secretarial positions are dominated by women in the US and in many other national contexts as well. So we can, I think we can expect to see this across national contexts. But 
it might be particularly acute in Japan, um, specifically because of this low migration regime. So people often point the finger uh, at Japan for having very high rates of gender inequality, but we might think of Japan as having made a, a kind of different trade-off um, than most Western countries have, where uh, Japan, simply because it has few foreign workers, has relatively little ethnic inequality, uh, but what that means is that native-born ethnic majority women uh, are more likely to be the face of low status jobs in many different uh, contexts, creating stronger reinforcement for the cycle of gender inequality for those native born ethnic majority women. Uh, so I will end there and I look forward very much to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. It's a fascinating um, uh, presentation and interesting logic here as well. I, I think we have, uh, so we are open the floor and uh, just um, get questions. Okay, uh, Hiroshi, uh, you're the first, please go ahead. Uh, 